topic is 60 million and counting, the proof behind why abortion is harmful. As shown in this graph, approximately 5 million deaths were reported as, as a result of the Civil War. From 1941 to 1945, 6 million Jews were discriminated against and mercilessly killed in the Holocaust due to faulty science. During World War I, 40 million deaths occurred. These events were shameful aspects of American history, but the numbers are microscopic in comparison to America's largest source of death. Since the ruling of Roe v. Wade in 1973, over 60 million lives have been lost to abortion, making abortion the largest genocide in American history. We fully understand that abortion is a decision that no woman wants to make. However, if abortion is continu to continually chosen, murder will become a normalized concept in our society. Therefore, we ask the question, why should the practice of induced abortion be eradicated in America? Our thesis asserts that induced abortion needs to be eradicated because science proves it's murder, it historically paral parallels dehumanization in America, and it is psychologically damaging. Abortion should be made illegal because through DNA and blood typing, science proves that an embryo is not part of the mother's body, but an autonomous life form, and that life begins at conception. It is commonly argued that the fetus is part of the female body, but blood typing proves that although the unborn child is located inside of the mother, the body within her is not an element of her own body. Blood types are classified as either arch negative or arch positive, and fetuses often have different blood types than their mothers. According to the ADAM Medical Encyclopedia, when an arch positive fetus's blood enters the bloodstream of this arch negative mother, the mother's immune system creates antibodies that attack the fetus's blood in her bloodstream. Furthermore, if those antibodies cross over into the placenta, they then begin killing and attacking the fetus's blood. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services states that the, bo the female body will react to the baby's blood as a foreign substance. If the baby's blood is a foreign substance to the mother's body, the baby itself cannot be a piece of her body, but a separate autonomous human being. Adding to this argument, not only is the fetus's body not merely part of the female's body, but its life actually starts at conception. I will preface this claim with the fact that Stephen Andrew Jacobs, who has a PhD in social sciences, surveyed and revealed that 95% of biologists affirm the biological belief that human's life begins at fertilization. Sperm and ovum each contain 23 chromosomes, and when they meet, they fuse and create one cell called the zygote. This process, referred to as conception, marks the beginning of life. This zygote contains 46 chromosomes that have a brand new variation of DNA that is unknown to this world. This DNA contains every biological feature of the now developing human. These features include hair color, eye color, blood type, sex, and even genetic diseases. When this DNA is established, life begins because though it is a single cell, the zygote <laughs> defines a fully developed human. Mitchell and Matthew Roth, associate professor at Harvard Medical School, affirms these facts by stating that an important fact of embryology is that a new human member indeed starts his or her existence as one cell, the zygote. If the child's life begins at conception, then abortion is murder. As we go through historic patterns of dehumanization through racist and sexist discrimination, abortion is a human rights crisis regarding unborn children. Slavery, a prominent racist human rights issue of American history, and the abortion system are both catalyzed by dehumanization and assumed ownership. United Nations defines human rights, including life and liberty, and freedom from slavery and torture as inherent to all human beings, regardless of status. While the unborn are scientifically human, they are denied life and often tortured when the mother chooses abortion. Benjamin Shapiro, a lawyer and best-selling author on controversial topics, relates the abortion system to slavery because of the treatment of both slaves and unborn children as property. Referring to a social group in American history that defined people arbitrarily as property for hundreds of years, Shapiro rationalizes that the pro-choice opinion would theoretically be similar to a slave owner's. If they find slaves as property, questions, who are you to tell them that it's not their property? An analogous statement can be applied to the pro-choice opinion today, challenging the justification of individuals defining people as property. After enduring centuries of sex discrimination, American women in the 1910s fought for political voices and human rights. Ironically, abortion allows women to dehumanize and die basic rights to their children, something women themselves experienced in the 1900s. Women's suffrage leader Alice Paul referred to abortion as the ultimate exploitation of women and the killing of unborn women. Societal pressure for women to end unborn children's lives alludes to the similarities between sexism in the 1910s and, and ageism now. Feminists for Life, an organization asserting that women deserve better than abortion, agrees that protection of a woman's body must begin where her body begins, regardless of her location in or out of the womb. It appears hypocritical of the women's movement to refuse their discomfort, pain, and physical limitation although it is unquestionably difficult, but encourage the poison, dismemberment, and death of unborn women. Shapiro claims that the concept of individuals defining the value of human life logically permits anyone to dehumanize anybody that they wish to victimize for their own particular purposes. In essence, denying unborn women basic rights refutes the anti-discriminatory and equal rights goals of the feminist movement. Several psychological studies indicate that abor induced abortion should be eradicated because it damages women me mentally, emotionally, and relationally. 
One of the major factors as to why abortion is psychologically damaging is because it frequently causes mental and emotional health issues such as suicidal thoughts, depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorders. When human development professor Priscilla Coleman analyzed the National Comorbidity Survey, which is an annual report of all mental health issues, she observed that women who have received an abortion have a 95% increased risk of developing bipolar depression and severe mood swings. Hannah Howard, a research associate in healthcare ethics, also noticed that post-abortive women are at a 154% higher risk of maternal suicide, which is suicide that occurs within one year after pregnancy. This data is proof that abortion endangers more than just the unborn child. Howard also noted that women who aborted were significantly more likely to require psychiatric treatment compared to women who carried to term. The Nebraska Family Alliance, the longest standing nonprofit pro-life education organization, collected data that showed that over half of post-abortive women suffer from symptoms of post-abortion syndrome, which is a form of PTSD. Areas of this include sleeping disorder, flashbacks of the procedure or hallucinations of childlike images, alcohol or drug addictions, frequent panic and anxiety attacks, and triggers to sounds similar to those heard in the procedure. These symptoms, along with many others, have the potential to affect women for years after the procedure and can occur daily. Abortion can also impact the relatives of the aborted mother, seeing how many affected families grieve as though they have lost any other family member. Rama International, post-abortion recovery and therapy organization, lists several examples of ways that abortion can affect each family member of a post-abortive mother. For instance, subsequent children of the aborted mother can be affected specifically in three ways mentioned by Rama. Several children feel as though they are a replacement for a child that their mother may have regretted aborting, resulting in low self-esteem. Additionally, some children are impacted because their mother is extremely cautious or overprotective of them, possibly fearful of losing another child. Some children are haunted by knowing details about the aborted baby, which can instill fear in the child. Lastly, Focus on the Family, a pro-life organization centered around familial relationships, discusses how abortion can impact spouse or partner relationships. A study showed that couples felt a higher level, higher level of distress or worry that their partner would feel dissatisfied with their relationship after the abortion. When couples decide to have another child after the, after the abortion, they can experience feelings of fear or nervousness. These distressed feelings can lead to mental health issues like those previously mentioned, and when combined, they have the potential to make a family crumble. The argument in favor of abortion is that women should have the right to choose, to choose whether to keep or end a pregnancy. Bearing children is painful, expensive, and immensely draining. Gretchen Goldman, research director for the Center of Science and Democracy, argues that an unwanted pregnancy causes more distress to the fully developed body of the mother than an abortion causes to a clump of cells that would become a baby. In the first stage of pregnancy, the embryo is a single cell and it lacks multi-system multi -system cellular organization, not developing, developing a heartbeat until six weeks after conception, whereas a pregnant woman already has all characteristics of life. Americans who defend the right to have an abortion question whether the clump of cells within the female body has more rights than the woman bearing the child. However, this question is answered by Matthews Roth. Human life begins at conception, so when a woman chooses an abortion, she's not merely controlling what is happening to her body, she's controlling what is happening to someone else's body. To combat the number of abortions performed in America, many solutions are available. While 79% of women were not counseled on non-abortive options, and 64% of women felt pressure to abort their baby, 80% of women decide not to abort after hearing their baby's heartbeat. Open education on all of the women's options can reduce the number of uncounseled women. However, training would need to be provided from structures to educate people on abortion, as well as the funds for this training. Because many women choose abortion over the adoption system, providing better funding to adoption or foster care systems will reduce the frequency of abortion, but this money will need to come from somewhere, thus compromising funding from other places. Finally, to provide access to the baby's heartbeat for more women, our team's solution is that free ultrasound should be made available for pregnant women so that they are informed on the date of their womb and their options. Save the Storks, an American anti-abortion organization, has already implemented this idea by creating buses that provide free ultrasounds for women who with unwanted pregnancies. These buses are driven around the country, educating women on all their options and providing pre- and post-birth care. Some implications of this solution include the open education for women, non-aggressive combat toward abortion centers, and continual care even after the baby is born. Free ultrasounds also have limitations, such as shortages of money, resources, and volunteers. However, with enough support from the American public and a lack of interference from the government and abortion centers, the simple sound of a baby's heartbeat could save many lives, create a better American society, and prevent trauma among women. Uh, ladies, thanks. Okay, Grace, we're going to start with you. So, uh, Grace, could you give one specific way that your thinking changed as a result of learning about Andrea's findings? Uh, yes. Um, 
I had never really thought about the historical um, perspective of abortion before I had researched this and combined my critique with Andrea's, because typically when I thought of abortion before, I usually, uh, my mind went to science or politics. So thinking of the ways that his history has changed and can be related to abortion is very new for me. So as I learned of Andrea's findings, this really helped my overall understanding of the topic. Okay, thank you. Andrea then. Uh, what is an example of a compelling argument from one of your peers' individual reports that you decided to exclude from your presentation? Why? One of the arguments that we decided to exclude was Natalie's argument about viability, which claimed that um, the unborn being inside the mother was not a human yet because it could not live on its own, which she refuted by saying that um, people who live on pacemakers or, ox or oxygen tanks also cannot live on their own, but they're still considered human. So we decided to cut that out because of time, and we just we felt that the other points that she made, which were about blood and consumption and DNA, that those were more important to put into our presentation because they were more relatable and easily understood. Okay, thank you. All right, finally, then Natalie, uh, can you describe an argument for one of your peers as individual reports that made you think differently about your team's solutions? <clears throat> Andrea's um, lens made me think differently about our team solution because she really pointed out the fact that all these horrible things happen in American history and that like have so many parallels between abortion and what happened and all those things really took a lot of radical change so when we're making solutions we have to look at how do we make these changes to move past this and so that people in the future will look back and see abortion as this horrible thing that we did and should never happen again. Okay. All right. Well, thank you.